Good morning. So uh, I would like to open up the service with a prayer. Um, as many of you may know that Carl Beneshek went into the hospital a few days ago. And uh, as of 7.30 uh, this morning, he's in a, a open heart surgery. He has a triple bypass uh, surgery. So I haven't heard an update yet on how he's doing, but I'd just like to take a moment so we can pray for him and the family. Heavenly Father, we just pray for Carl in this time. Lord, we pray for the surgeon's um, expertise, that you would guide their hands, Lord, that they would um, be able to, uh, that the surgery would be successful, Lord, that um, your hand would just be in it, Lord, and as you're um, working on um, restoring Carl, Lord, we just pray for the family, Lord, that you would be with them, bring them comfort, Lord, and just know that your peace is with them, Lord. I just pray that all of us would continue to pray for them until we have an update, Lord. And Lord, we, we're so grateful for the Carl, the Beneshek family, Trenton and Maya, John, Savannah, all the siblings, Monica, Lord. I just pray for all of them, Lord, in this time and that you just give them peace and that the, the surgery is successful and that Carl's on uh, the path back to recovery, Lord. Um, we're so grateful for that family, Lord, and we just pray that you would look over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, thank you for, for joining me in that moment in prayer, and that's, a, that's a, kind of what our series is about, is unity, that we unite together as believers, that we unite together in prayer to our Savior for each other, making petitions for each other, and that's what uh, this passage is all about, John 17, is Jesus coming before the Father and making a petition on our behalf. He's praying for us. This is the night before he is crucified. They're at the Last Supper, and he's praying. They've gone through the Last Supper. He's taught them a lot. They've had the communion, and now he is praying his final prayer, which is the largest recorded prayer Jesus has ever has in the Scriptures, and he's praying for us. He's praying for our unity. And uh, last week, we really observed this passage from Jesus' perspective, from God's perspective. Why is unity so important to Jesus? Why is this the focus of his last prayer among his disciples? Why is unity so important to Jesus? And first, he opens in prayer that he's connecting with the Father, but he's also, it's corporate prayer. It's in the presence of the apostles, the disciples. So there's unity in that, in just the act of prayer. But also, unity is in Jesus' character, his very character. It's so important to him because he's a triune God. He's one God in three persons. It's in his character that he is united. He is united with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And our final point last week was unity comes out of love and for love. And that is who God is. God is love. So it's in Jesus' very character that um, he values unity. He's a united God. And that's what, coming from that, we're going to look at, okay, so he's praying this prayer not just to the Father, but in the presence of his uh, disciples, uh, apostles. So there's something for them to take out of it and something in turn for us to take from it as he re they recorded his prayer uh, in this chapter, this uh, chapter 17. And I, I know the temptation from a, a preacher's point of view, Jesus has been teaching them this whole night, talking to them. And I, I, I just know from my point of view, okay, that final prayer at the end of the sermon, I'm just going to kind of rehash some of what I said. Sometimes I feel like, oh, am I really praying to God or am I just kind of reminding you of what I just said? And, and it, I know this is a temptation for all of us in corporate prayer when we come before like, okay, this is my chance to kind of say some things to y'all uh, that I maybe I I didn't want to say, but I'm like pretending it's a prayer. Like, uh, oh, Heavenly Father, uh, I just pray that Jessica would just put on some more deodorant and uh, um, just, you know, she stank a little. So, uh, but, but Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is not a gossiping, uh, petty God. He, he, he's a loving God and he does it for our benefit. He is preaching to, he is speaking to the Father, but it's also a unity for our benefit. So, um, so we get to benefit from this passage and the unity uh, that comes from it and what we can learn from his example in this prayer. So let's open up uh, to John chapter 17, and we're going to start in verses 6 through 13. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. 
Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy filled in themselves. Which brings us to our first point, unity in Christ. So what I really want to highlight here is how repetitive the language is that Jesus is saying, you have given them to me, Lord, Father. They were yours, and you trusted me with them, and I have kept them. I have uh, taken what you have given me, and we're united in this front that these are your people, Lord, and that they're united in me, and I have preserved them. You, you gave them to me in trust, and I have kept every single one of them, except for the son of destruction, who is Judas. And he didn't lose Judas because he, he failed. That was, as it says in the passage, that that was foretold, that he was the son of destruction, that that was already the plan, that Judas was going to fall away. And what we could take from this is there's a confidence in our unity in Christ, that if we are united in Christ, that Jesus has us secure that we know that we are secure in him, that he is holding on to us, that this is a, a unity that is not based on our ability to be united. It has nothing to do with how much I get along with all of you or other believers. It, it, doesn't even ha um, it isn't even measured by how much I connect with God or feel united with God in prayer or the, the word. It, it's his. It's all him holding on to us. And when we are united with Christ, there's no letting go. Uh, he's not letting go of us. That, that's a, a sure thing. Uh, I want to read in uh, John chapter 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I just see like the, 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 the language that's so similar to the passage we just read, saying we were in the Father's hand, and he says they are in my hand, the Father has given me, and no one is going to snatch them out of my hand. And what this means for unity is that whether we know it or not, we are united in Christ, whether we fully understand that concept. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, there's an inherent unity amongst us all, whether we can act on it or not, or, or there's, whether we're petty and small and we're praying about people's smells or something like that, or, or that we do take hold of it and we really try to uh, connect with each other. The unity is not on our, in our hands, our ability. We are united. It's in our nature when we uh, become believers in Jesus Christ. We are automatically united with all of other believers. And we're united with God. He's not letting us go. So there's that assurance of salvation along with that. So that's the comfort. That's the, okay, whether you know it or not, we're all united. Everyone in this room who believes in Jesus Christ, there's an unbreakable unity amongst us. We are the sheep of his pasture. We, we all have the same master. We all have the same shepherd. We are united in that, and there's no separating that. There's no uh, infighting or um, arguing that's going to break that unity, even though it may feel like that in, in this world. But outside of this world, we are his, and we cannot escape that. And that's an exciting thing, that like no matter how unthinkable that that relationship may seem like oh man I've just messed up so much in that relationship I've said the wrong thing there or I don't know how I'm going to reconcile with this other believer we've just we've said things we shouldn't have said we've gone too far how are we going to restore this just know that 
that unity between us is not broken because that's in God's hands. And there's work we can do, and we want to seek reconciliation and to restore that relationship. But there is an inherent unity. But I want to get to the the next passage where we can see even though there is unity, it may not always feel like that. So let's continue um, in John 17, 14 through 19. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. The word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. Remember that, that phrase, sanctified in truth. So our, our first uh, point was, okay, we are united in Christ. Like once we become believers, we, we, we get this whole family that we're not getting away from, no matter how ugly Thanksgiving uh, dinner gets. Like we're, we're not getting away from each other. We've been adopted into this family. And that's an awesome thing, uh, as uncomfortable as it may become at times. But we are united in Christ and then next we are, there's unity in truth. Now this is where, okay, I'm, we're in this team. We are believers in Jesus Christ, but sometimes uh, we, we know we're not of the world, but sometimes the world gets confusing to us. And that's where we need to be sanctified in truth. That's where we, we may not know that we're on this team all the time. Have you ever seen the, the peewee leagues in, in football where the kid catches the ball and starts running the wrong way, starts running towards the other uh, goal line? Like, he's still on the right te- his, you know, his team, but he's running the wrong way because he's not, to use the, the biblical language here, sanctified in truth. He doesn't know what the truth is. He's lost. He's confused. And that's where we're called. Jesus is calling us. Uh, for unity in truth. And that takes time. That takes practice. That takes understanding what the truth is. What are we called to? And seeking that truth so that, yes, we're united, but let's make sure we're all pulling in the same direction that we're, we understand so that we're not hurting each other in the process and the world isn't confusing us. Right now we're in a political season and the temptation is to really, you know, cling on to what the world is throwing at us. That we, we see, oh, I, I want to unify with this party, or I want to unify with this party, or, I, uh, you know, I'm proud to be American. That's my identity. That's my, I, I, I'm united with Americans. But if we aren't focused on that first point, unity in Christ, then we're not doing the unity in truth properly. That we're not sanctified in the correct truth, that we're distracted by the things of the world. And like it says here, we are not of this world. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 13 through 15. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been bought, uh, brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. This is why Jesus came. This is why he came for us, so that he could save us, but also unite us in him. Unite us in the truth. He, he's removed all the old commandments, all the things that we were, uh, that, that the Pharisees would unite under. Like, okay, I'm going to fulfill all these laws, and that's where my unity is. That's where I'm connecting with all the other Pharisees. And the Sadducees are not my people. Or the, the, uh, the Gentiles, they're not my people. I'm united under the law. And what Jesus is saying to us here is that we need to know the truth that will sanctify us, the truth that actually unites us, the truth that we need to focus on, because the world will try to distract us. And not just the the secular world, the world outside of Christianity, it also within Christianity, 
It's going to try and distract us. It's going to try and pull us away from the truth by making us focus and divide over small things in the church, uh, whether that's um, doctrine that isn't essential, that there's maybe some debate over, or maybe the style of worship or, or how a service is performed. It, the enemy will attack us even within our own church, within our own language, uh, amongst ourselves. So we are not of the world, and we need to make sure that politics, race, gender, nationality, citizenship, that this isn't our identity, that the only truth in our identity is that we are united in Christ, and that's who we are, because none of those other things will save us. None of those other things even get carried into eternity. None of those those things matter in the long term. All that matters is Christ and what he did for us and our unity in that. Let's read uh, Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are united in Christ. That's it. All those other things, those are the worldly things they're talking about. And that's not of us. We're not a part of that. They're distractions, and they may get in our way. It may get in the way of our unity. They may try to split us up, divide us. But none of those other things matter. And nothing can separate us, not only from the love of Christ, but from unity with Him and unity with each other. And that's the sanctifying process, the sanctification in truth that we are set apart in truth, that knowing that Jesus Christ is the only way to unity. Now, we know this, and, or or maybe we don't, I don't know, maybe you're learning this the first time, but, um, but you, you may look at the church, the church, Christian church throughout history, and wonder if Jesus desires unity so much, and if all these people are being sanctified in the truth through this process, why is there so much division throughout church history? Why has the church split so many times? And, and, and sometimes the church does need to split if that sanctity of truth is uh, at risk. If something essential about our faith is being challenged, there needs to be a split. But other times, it's petty politics or, or preferences or just infighting that splits the church. And other times it's, you know, maybe not others, just maybe there's preference and there's, it's not a hard split. It's just, I'll do church over here. You do church over there. We'll wave at the supermarket. Um, but I think God wants so much more than, than that even. So I, I wanted to talk about some of the major splits and see where they fall um, uh, in, in this uh, unity and where it is appropriate to split and where not so much. So the first schism, uh, major schism, schism is like a split of the church. Like, okay, we don't agree, so we're going to say, uh, you're going to hell, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say you're going to hell, you're going to say I'm going to hell, because we, we, we're completely split. We cannot reconcile. We are not united on this. And these, this is man's decision. Some of it may be God-led, and we'll discuss each one of those. But the first major schism, the, the Chalcedonian schism, I'd never heard of this until I started doing research. But it, it makes sense. It was a, a split that happened because uh, some people were saying that Jesus wasn't fully man, that Jesus was only divine. And then the other side was saying Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. And I think that's an appropriate split. I think if you don't believe that Jesus came as, as a man and died for our sins and rose in a bodily form, that, that's, that's a key major aspect of our faith that we can't uh, reconcile. Um, and and that's, uh, that was the split there. And I'd say about, uh, according to my research, about 95% of uh, Christianity from that point on um, accepted that Jesus was 100% man and 100% uh, God. But there's still that 5% that says, no, he was fully God and not man. So the second major schism you may be more familiar with, this was the split of the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. 
And this was purely politics. They, this was just a power struggle. They wanted to know, like, uh, is the Pope in Rome in control? Or I think the other was Constantinople, uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox. Who, who's in charge of the church and who is running things? And this is all power-based. This isn't found in Scripture. This isn't like they were... I, I'm sure they could open up Scripture and make points like that they thought they were right. But in reality, you look back at it and you say, this, this was petty, this was small, this was not God-led. He didn't want it to split in this way. And they're still split today. Uh, I, I'm sure they're, they're friendlier with each other now. Uh, they, I'm sure they get along. But these are still two separate uh, sects of Christianity that split uh, a thousand years uh, after the church was formed. And, uh, and that's unity that still hasn't been reunited. And then the third major schism, the one that you're probably most familiar with because it, it affects us the most, is the Protestant uh, Reformation. And that is when um, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis uh, to the door. And that's where uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church was just becoming more and more corrupt, that they were um, leaving the, the sanctification of the truth more and more behind, and that a Reformation, the goal wasn't to split. That was not the Protestants' uh, goal. Reformation means they wanted to bring it back to how it was, that the church used to be pure, it used to be good, it used to be focused on the truth, but things had... Uh, you know, over time, uh, new rules came in. It became more works-based. You, you paid indulgences to cover your sins or, or to cover the sins of your uh, family members who had passed away. Just things were being added that weren't from Scripture. And uh, this, is, this was, you know, good Christians, good Catholics saying, can we get back to how things were? Can we go back to the Scripture? Can we bring it back to how it was? And ultimately, there was a split. They, they couldn't agree on it. And some of it was violent. Some of it wasn't. Uh, but then the, the Protestants uh, were formed. And that you're in a Protestant church. If you don't know that, welcome. It's great to have you. <laughs> if you're Catholic, we, we love to have you here. I, um, but now, okay, so we reformed things. We got back to Scripture. Things are good again. We, we're united. We're still praying for our, our Catholic and our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. Uh, but uh, we, we, we got Scripture down. We got it all figured out, right? Like, we, we, we perfected it. Let's take a look at some of the Protestant uh, denominations. Okay, <laughs> you got that? So these are, these are lists of Protestant dom denominations, and it's broken down by like, okay, if you believe this, go this direction, and we'll get you into the right church, you know? So, um, so yeah, so you follow that one, and oh, what's that one right there? Can you, can you go to the next slide? Oh, that's us. I don't know if you can see it. But that's the evangelical free church. We, that's the denomination we're from. That's where you know, Gil and Amy, are. their missions field is from, the evangelical free church. We're, we're very tiny in the bottom there. But don't take a picture of this, because what's really funny about this, and what I like about it, is it's wrong. <laughs> if, you, if you follow the, the, the diagram, the, 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 the split... What it says is wrong. It says, the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit are still in operation today. If you say yes, you're a charismatic Baptist or you go to Calvary Chapel. If you say no, you're an evangelical free church. And that's not true. That is not a stance we take. We, uh, as a free church, it, we don't take that stance. You can believe in the continuation of the, the, uh, the gifts, the, the, um, the spiritual gift of, of healing or tongues. You can believe that, or you can say, no, it, it, it ended with the original apostles. And we're not going to split over that. That's not uh, something we're going to take a hard stance here at an evangelical free church. Some evangelical free church pastors believe one way, and some believe the other. So if Paul Hody were to read that, you'd know for sure that he'd say, uh-uh, that, that ain't true. <laughs> Paul was, yeah, anyways, but, <laughs> but this is the stance we take at EV Free. The, the, the next slide, please. The significance of silence, and this is where we find a lot of our unity here at Crosswinds Church. Once the early free church leaders began to put in writing what was commonly believed among them, they were silent on those doctrines which through the centuries had divided Christians of equal dedication. 
biblical knowledge, spiritual maturity, and love for Christ. This significance of silence reflected our strong concern for evangelical unity in the gospel. So what we've done in the evangelical free church, we're kind of a denomination, kind of not, but we focused on the truth, the truth that matters. Yes, there are truths that we can argue about, that we have disagreements about, uh, predestination or, um, you know, the spiritual gifts, those kind of things. But that's not going to divide us because we know the essentials are the truth that we're going to focus on. And I love, this was from the uh, EV Free website. I love that it, it, it highlights that some very intelligent people are on both sides. A lot of people have debated and argued these things. And it's not worth dividing over because it's not essential to what we're doing in the church. It's not essential to our unity in Christ. So we, we can have spirited uh, debates and, and discussions, but when it starts to affect our unity, that's when we need to humble ourselves and say, you are my brother or sister in Christ, and I'm not going to let this divide us. I'm not going to let this break our, our communion and our worship together, that we serve the same God, and let's focus on the truth that matters. So that brings us uh, to the next part. Let's read in John 17, 2 through 3. So we're going earlier in the passage now. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we, we had unity in Christ and then we're growing in our unity through, uh, through the truth, sanctification through the truth. We're understanding our unity more and more and why we're uni- united. And now we are um, focusing on unity. God is calling us to be united in the way. So what is the way? Well, Matthew seven thirteen through 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So it's saying here that, like, it's difficult. It's difficult to find the way, to be united, to find everlasting life. And I just think, okay, if, if the, the gate is narrow and few who find it, wouldn't it make sense that it would be more difficult to be united? I mean, there, there's fewer of us making it through. So wh- wh- why, is, why are we focused on the main truth and not maybe making it more expansive? Like, why don't we make it more difficult to get through the way, as it says here in Scripture? And... Th- The thing is, that's our doing then. We're deciding how narrow the gate is. We're deciding what's the requirements to make it through the narrow gate to everlasting life. And that's our own making. And that's that's always what causes division, is when we start to decide what God has already decided for us. When we're saying, this is what saves you, and not paying attention to what God says what saves you. So what does God say about the way? In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We are united in Christ. We are united in the truth. And we are united in the way, who is, again, Jesus Christ. If we, he is the way. He has defined what that narrow way is. We, and it may sound broad. It's like, oh, Jesus is the way. All we have to do is follow him. And it's not for us to define how wide or narrow or who gets through the gate is. He has done that here. He says, I am the only way to the Father, to eternal life. So that's an encouragement because when I read that first passage, I get nervous. I'm like, oh no, what do I have to do? I'm I'm not that great. I'm I'm probably the, the many. But he's saying, no, I was the one who made a way for you. It's not about your righteousness. It's not about your ability to follow all these rules. Just follow me. I have made the way. So 
What is the way leading us to? What are we called to do? We're united in Christ. We, we have all these brothers and sisters. We're figuring out, okay, we're, we're united around Jesus and what he's done for us. So what are we, where are we going? What are we doing? What, where is this way leading? Yes, to eternal life, but what are we supposed to do on the way? And he calls us to the Great Commission, to go into our worlds and preach the gospel, to make disciples. That's what we're united in. That's where we're going. That's what we're doing. How we accomplish it, how we uh, do it, whether we're, we're meeting in a church like this, whether we're meeting in homes, whether we're going on the mission field or just into our backyard, we're all going in the same direction. We're all united together to preach the gospel, to go to, to our worlds, as we say here. So it talks about eternal life in these two past two verses, verses two and three. Uh, and I just want to highlight that because that is our, our end destination. We are going to spend eternity with Christ, united with each other, uh, you know, uh, and that might be a little bit awkward when we first get there because there's some people that we kind of bumped heads with or like, oh, you're here? I didn't know we were that united. So, um, but when we get there, what are we going to be doing? How does unity affect us there? And uh, in Jesus' prayer, uh, the Lord's prayer, when he was teaching us how to pray, he said, uh, this is how you pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And what, did, what does unity look like in heaven? What could unity look like on earth as we pray that prayer? In Revelations 7, 9, at the end of time, it gives us a vision of what unity looks like in heaven so let's read that. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. That's unity. That's all, all people who have been united in Christ. All people who have learned the truth, have followed the truth. There's all the petty things that we argue about and fight over in our personal lives or over, you know, uh, vague doctrine or those kind of things. None of that's there. We're all together. Every tribe, nation, and tongue. The whole world is there. And we are to pray that. That's what Jesus says, on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying for this on earth. Not just that we'll get there, you know, when we pass away, we're in heaven, this will happen. No, we're to pray for this today, that we seek this unity today, that Jesus is praying this to the Father, that they would have the unity that you and I would have, and that we are listening to that and saying, this is Jesus's desire for us. He says it in this prayer and in chapter 17, that we would be united. So, I've always just assumed, okay, uh, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and, and uh, Protestants, we're, we're never going to be reunited. You know, they're too big of a divide, too many differences, too many doctrinal issues. But I'm giving up. I'm, I'm limiting God. I'm limiting what He can do. I, you know, and, and that's the big picture. We can start in our own backyard, the different denominations of Protestantism, or, or just amongst ourselves here at Crosswinds, just starting here is how can I be united with those I have differences with? How can I be united with the peop very people in here I'm sitting with that are going to vote differently than me in this next coming month? How can I be united with those people who have a different sports team even than me? <laughs> and, and as we, you know, practice amongst ourselves, we love each other and we grow in that, then what can God do? What, what can he do with that prayer on earth as it is in heaven? It, there's a church that Jesus built, and he wants to see it united. How can we come together and make that happen? Let's read uh, Psalms 133, 1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us, that you want to see us thriving, Lord, and that unity is such a beautiful thing in this this world, Lord, that we can be united in you on our way to you in eternity, Lord, and that that's something that you want to see here on earth, that we're united, not fighting amongst each other, Lord, but we're united. Lord, I pray for 
pray that for Crosswinds Church. I pray that for each and every one of us, Lord. I pray that for the churches in Marina Valley. I pray that for the church in America and the world, Lord, that we would be united, that we would see a revival of your church, that there's a, a unity that could happen that we never thought would, um, would ever happen, Lord, that there's just too great a divide that we could ever imagine you could repair, Lord. I pray for that revival that you would bring your churches together, that we would set aside the non-essentials, Lord, and go together to preach the gospel, to share your word. In Jesus' name, amen.